<laughs> like it or not. Um, I'll be reading from my novel, The Eternal Prison, which is actually book three in a series. Um, I'm not going to attempt to distill two and a half books into a few words for you, so you, I'm going to just throw you in, sink or swim. Um, what I will say is that the, the book is set in the future dystopia. Um, the, I'd say the central theme of the whole series is sort of an anti-singularity where I'm exploring, in a way, how the merging of technology and humanity is not going to necessarily free us to do anything we want, but it might actually imprison us and ruin our lives in a lot of ways. Um, the protagonist of the book is a very bad man <laughs> who, through two and a half books at this point, has been on a very disturbing downward spiral uh, as he gets caught up in the gears of this dystopia. And he's recently been arrested and sent to a prison where their solution for overcrowding and budget problems is to download every prisoner's brain onto a mainframe where they can then take centuries if they want to get around to you and interrogate you at their, at their leisure. <clears throat> Someone was singing. A woman's voice lilted softly, far away, coming to me through layers of pain and darkness. A breathy, girlish sort of voice. I thought of my mother for the first time in decades. I remembered little about her, but this voice, for some reason, brought her back to me. I remembered her fat arms, the fine hairs on them reaching out for me. That was it. That's all I had. After a moment, I realized I was moving, gliding along. She continued singing, low and almost sexy, and then drifted into humming, sounding happy. You are awake, she said suddenly. You've been waiting for a long time. That's too bad for you. I opened my eyes. A shiny electrical conduit snaked above me, bolted into the rough cement. I turned my head and looked around, and as I did so, sound rushed back to me, a sizzling silence broken only by the squeaking wheel of the gurney I was strapped onto. By tilting my head backward a bit, I brought her into view. An old woman, mid-forties maybe, blonde hair unnaturally vivid and face unnaturally smooth and refreshed looking. She was wearing a simple suit of black fabric and a bright white lab coat. She glanced down at me and smiled, nodding once and looking back up. Why, I asked, my throat burning, is that bad for me? Her smile kinked up in the corners, becoming cruel. The procedure is extremely invasive. I'd say, when I've read this in the past, I sometimes tried to do a little Batman voice when the character spoke, you know, Christian Bale, and it did not go well, so you can thank me. <clears throat> There's also actual lyrics to the song she's singing in here that I'm not singing for you, so you can thank me for that as well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I tested the straps and found them professionally applied. My arms pinned down so tightly I was pretty sure the circulation had been stopped. I remembered Marlena staring down at me and thought her face had been honestly horrified, honestly surprised as that cocksucker Micheline took the hover up, leaving me to the dogs, leaving me to this. I still wasn't afraid. I imagined dying, just everything turning off, suddenly gone and felt nothing. I didn't worry about dying. I'd been coasting on fumes for so long, I think somewhere in the shadowed parts of my brain I'd already decided, I'd already decided I was dead, in a sense. But I was angry. The cocksucker had lied to me about everything, about my father. I'd known deep down, I'd known all along that I'd wanted it to be true, to have that connection. I was a fucking punk, but I was going to make Mickey eat it. I strained my arms against the straps. They didn't even budge. I had work to do. It was going to be hell finding one small man buried in the shit of the system, especially with a fucking civil war going on. But if I could just get one arm free, I was going to break this woman's neck and get started. <laughs> do not struggle, dear, she murmured, not looking at me. You're quite secure. I believed her. Her face was round and plump, a well-fed face with a ruddy complexion and a cheerful expression. The bitch was smiling as she pushed me towards processing. Who are you, I asked. My voice came out thick and rusty, phlegm pulled in the back of my throat. Her smile brightened, but she didn't look down at me. Above her, above her, the conduit streamed along, occasionally bending this way and that. Now why does that matter, dear? I made my face into a smiling mask, even though she wasn't looking at me. I'm taking names for future reference, so I can kill everyone who touches me here. <laughs> I don't know that it's a unique way. Um, I think one of the, the, the real benefits or one of the real sort of advantages of fantasy and science fiction is that you, they are about people. 
um, you know, I, I understand that many people believe that fantasy and science fiction are essentially about gadgets or science or uh, magic or elves or whatever, but you know, ultimately all of this stuff is, is just stories about people. They are transplanted into other settings which are sometimes allegorical for um, the, the, the modern day present settings that we deal with right now. Um, and you know, sometimes they're not allegorical, but I think you know, if you transplant the, the normal human interactions into those settings with you know, those uh, uh, tropes around, then you, know, you tend to see uh, parallels with the real modern world. Um, the, the setting that uh, Roman is referring to is um, actually the cover of the book. Um, but um, actually, it, for those who may not have seen it, there are bookmarks here which have a tiny, tiny image of the cover, if I can pass this to you, if you'd like to pass those around. Um, and you can see what Sky looks like, or at least what the artist's rendition of Sky looks like, which is not quite what I had in mind, but it's actually perfect for the, the story just in general. Um, Sky is a, a palace on a big stick. Um, so it's, it's elevated above the city. There's a city below it, and you know, imagine a, a stalk about half a mile high. And at the top of that stalk, um, impossible architecture, but it's made by God, so hey. Um, and at the top of that stalk is a palace sitting on top of it, and this is from where the, the family that rules the world issues its edicts and uh, rules, um, literally from in the sky. Um, and so, you know, in this city, it's essentially a very small city, um, but in this city, which is occupied solely by the thousands of members of this family, um, this family, for various reasons, uh, are the only people that may live in Skye, and so the more distant members of the family from the throne, uh, the more distantly related members of the family, are the actual servants in Skye. And the, those who are closest to the throne are at the top of the, the social hierarchy there. Um, so, I mean, it seems very much like Manhattan to me. Um, you know, the, the, the people who can't afford to live close to Midtown are all out in the boroughs, like me in Brooklyn. Um, you know, I mean, we're all part of the same city, the same microcosm, but you see the same structure, um, and you see the same social hierarchy enacting itself over and over again in our world. Um, it just seemed natural to transplant that into a fantasy setting to me. The, the two things that I think uh, apply to that is, one, a lot of the characters in the book are at the very bottom of a social scale. And as a result, their lives aren't nearly as affected by the technology that's all around them. And a lot of times, the technology simply serves to corral them and control them. Um, it's not their servant. They are you know, imprisoned by it. And as a result, they're not that different from mm -hmm. anybody that you might you know, run into in a dark alley today, you know, who's a little desperate, a little hungry. Um, a little oppressed and ready to use their hands to just make something happen. So in that sense, I think it's really easy to make the connection with the characters, because uh, that's most of the characters are little lives in the book, you know, when you read it. So it's easy to make that connection because you know the the technology that might be in the sky, uh, amazing you, it's not yours, you know, and it's not theirs either. And so they they sort of come from that same point of view. Um, my other philosophical background when writing these stories is that I don't believe technology changes people very much. I think that it changes society. It can change the way people interact or the way we do things. But fundamentally, I think we remain very much similar. And I think that um, most of the characters you meet, no matter where they are on that social scale or what kind of technology they have at their command, um, I always envision them as just people. And they, have, they, they can be bastards and they can be good people, or they can be bad people, dumb or smart, um, but they're going to interact with each other more or less the same way you and I do right now. Um, just that they might have much more capability of mass destruction because they can press a button and uh -huh. horrible things happen. Uh -huh. So that was close to my approach there. Do you think so, this is I'm going to, to, I'm going to <laughs> argue. I'm going to make an argument. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with 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 uh, with what both uh, uh, Dora and Jeff have said, and yet, um, uh, ever since science fiction became uh, kind of a business in this country, uh, even before that, people were talking about well, what is science fiction? Well, what's the difference between science fiction and mainstream or non-science fiction? And one 
answer was, well, science fiction people are concerned about, they are concerned, I mean, they're people, of course, but they're concerned about, about the world and the fantasy people, too. They're, the, the, you've heard the phrase, what you, you know, did you write a story from that universe? They're, they're world builders, and they care about the rules of their world. And that's a kind of a, a different approach than writers who aren't in that, um, in that kind of category. And I think that, there, that some, there's something to that when you, when you look at works, and of course it's about human nature, it's about the human condition, but one writer is going to be kind of really, it's going to be important to get the laws of this particular universe right, and another writer is not, it's not as important. And maybe that's a kind of uh, division. So even though we're saying, yes, it's human, we're talking about the human condition, but we're really, all this, um, all this machinery uh, that's in the genre is really important to us. You know, it's interesting because when you talk about world building, I mean, uh, it's not a, it's not just a world of pure imagination. I mean, you can't necessarily just sit down and write anything you want because, especially as you develop a concept in a universe, as, as Michael was pointing out, you get rules. And you, you, the rules of your own invention, and as you can always tweak them or bend them or decide, okay, that one wasn't really a rule. I just made that up, you know, later on. But you still have a certain conformity to your own ideas you have to stick to. So it's like the, there's a, it's, it's like the Big Bang and that burst of inspiration. Like, I'm going to write a story about, you know, robot boxers or, or whatever. <laughs> and I can do anything. You know, I, they, they can be rock'em sock'ems, you know, and their heads pop off and, and this, that, and the other thing. And build a whole universe around it. And then when you're 50 pages in, suddenly you realize you have this great idea, oh, but I can't do that because back on page 25, I said that doesn't happen. Or, you know, mm -hmm. if I do that, then this can't happen or this doesn't make any sense. And you do get bogged down a little bit. So it's mm -hmm. it's interesting because you start off with total freedom, blank canvas. And as you work, you're sort of building a box around yourself. And by the time you're done, you're in this box. And granted, you can always invent you know, a little trap door to get out of the box, but sometimes your readers don't react well to that. And you know, Bobby <laughs> Ewing wakes up and it was all a dream. <laughs> 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 That's sort of the way I always look at it. That's why when I, when I finish something, I'm always a little let down. Because I might have created something I really love, but on the other hand, I can't go back and do it again. You know, it's done. I can do something different, but I'm not going to go back and create that universe again because it's over.